Book of Ruth is a family drama with global implications, as we see an unmarried widow end up with a baby son on The Bible Brief. Did you know that The Bible Brief is a listener-supported show? Consider becoming a monthly supporter at our link in the show notes. From Genesis chapter 2. In the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. When we read of the first marriage in the Bible between Adam and Eve, it's tempting to think of the brief explanation of marriage as a generality about coming together to consummate a marriage. A man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Yet rather than merely a generality, this forms the foundation for a legal passage of inheritance rights. Think about it for just a moment in a few steps. First, a man, the one with inheritance rights, leaves his father and mother. That is, he goes outside of his family in search of a woman. Second, he cleaves to his wife. Another way of saying he brings someone from outside his family and brings that woman into union with himself, giving her inheritance rights associated with him. Third, the man and the woman become one flesh. This probably refers to both the sexual union and the resulting seed or offspring from that union the children who are literally one flesh made from both of their parents. And fourth, the cycle starts again with the next generation, as the man with inheritance rights seeks a woman to marry. This little cycle of marriage is briefly described here in Genesis 2, verse 24. And if you can keep this cycle in mind, it's going to open up a book of the Bible to you. It's not only going to reveal the dramatic story of the book of Ruth, but it's going to unlock the ultimate point of this family story, tucked inside the time period of the Judges. The story begins with a woman named Naomi, and we find her tragic background in chapter 1 of the book of Ruth. In those days when the Judges ruled, there was a famine in the land of Canaan, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. They were Ephrathites in Bethlehem in Judah's tribal territory. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both sons died so that the woman Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. In the course of just a few sentences, Naomi's life goes from wife and mom to destitute widow. She, her husband, and her two sons travel from the land of Canaan to neighboring Moab, searching for food, and they stay there for a while. We soon find out that Elimelech, her husband, dies, followed by her two sons. But before those two sons die, they marry Moabite women. The men in Naomi's life all appeared to embrace a pragmatism that undermined their faith in Yahweh. Rather than stay in the land and wait for Yahweh to provide food, her husband Elimelech leaves Canaan for a rival land. Don't forget that the king of Moab had attempted to curse Israel before they entered the land of Canaan in the first place. Elimelech takes his family to a foreign land with foreign gods and foreign women, and soon his sons appear to embrace a pragmatism of their own. Outside of Canaan, they'd be hard-pressed to find an Israelite to marry as the law of Moses required. So they decide to just marry Moabite women instead. The men of the family show faithlessness to God. And in the end, all the men die without returning to the promised land. Naomi is left with no protection, no husband, and no sons. It's simply her and her two Moabite daughters-in-law. And already we can see the marriage theme beginning to develop in this little narrative. But there should be a question in all of our minds, too. Why should we care about this family? 
What does this family have to do with the big story of the Bible? Is there something special about them? Let's keep reading. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people Israel and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters, why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. In her new destitute situation, Naomi discovers that God has provided food again in Canaan, and she begins to make plans to go back there. However, she doesn't intend to bring her daughters-in-law with her. Instead, she encourages them to leave her and go find new husbands among the Moabites. Husbands that Naomi has no hope of providing to them in the form of more sons. She has no husband, and is probably too old to bear children. But the response of the daughters-in-law highlights a contrast between them. One of the daughters-in-law goes back to her mother's house, but Ruth remains with Naomi. In fact, we read that Ruth clung to Naomi. The same Hebrew word used in Genesis 2, when the man cleaves to his wife. This should perk up our ears. Ruth is cleaving to her new family and inheritance by marriage, rather than dissolving those rights and going to her own people. This isn't just her feigning commitment. She insists. And next we read this. Naomi said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you will go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Ruth, in cleaving to Naomi, is not only wanting to remain with her, but adopt everything about being in her Israelite family. Famously, Ruth says, Where you will go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Ruth is doing nothing less than abandoning her old life. She abandons her land, her gods, and her family in the favor of Naomi's. Though she has no hope for a husband from Naomi, and no prospects for material prosperity, she expresses an amazing faith in Yahweh and love for her mother-in-law. This confession and commitment from Ruth becomes the basis for the next part of the story. When the two women are back in the land of Judah, in the town of Bethlehem. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi, when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Notice here Naomi continuing to mourn the loss of her husband and her sons. She has no men to take care of her, and no one to protect her. She even tells them to call her Mara, meaning bitterness, because of how she perceives that Yahweh has treated her. Naomi is sad and grieving, but that's not where the story ends. Ruth still has a major part to play in this family drama. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. 
And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain. After him in whose sight I shall find favor. And Naomi said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to the young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers said, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. The third major person in the narrative is introduced as Boaz, someone related to Naomi's dead husband, Elimelech. Boaz owns a large property and employs servants to help him with his barley harvesting. And after a while, he notices a woman following his reapers, picking up pieces of barley that they left behind. Boaz was probably used to seeing poor men picking up the scraps of the harvest, but had probably rarely seen a woman doing it alone. The law of Moses allowed the poor to do this kind of activity, but even so, it was usually men doing this kind of labor. In any case, he takes notice of her and soon comes to speak to her, and he speaks with a merciful tenderness toward her plight. We read this in chapter 2, verse 8. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land to come to a people that you did not know before. Yahweh repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain. And she ate until she was satisfied and had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also pull out some of the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. Boaz is apparently taken with Ruth, but so far in the story, we're not sure to what extent. He extends to her a kind of grace and mercy that she probably hadn't experienced much in her life. It's apparent that he's providing even more than what the law of Moses required of him, too. Rather than merely let her glean the scraps from the harvest, he actually instructs his men to harvest bundles for her. Boaz appears to be one of those rare men in the time of the judges— who actually practices faithfulness to God and to his law. Soon, Ruth continues gleaning the barley and returns to Naomi with plentiful produce for them to eat. She tells Naomi of the kindness shown by Boaz and that he's instructed her to remain in the group of his young women for safety. You can imagine how pleased Naomi is by this news. Thanks to Boaz, it appears that they will have food and that Ruth will be safe out in the field. Soon, though, The barley and wheat harvests end. And Naomi has been thinking over this situation that they're in. She's been thinking about Boaz and about Ruth. And as she thinks, she gets a wonderful idea. Join us next time as we learn of Naomi's idea to bless Ruth, an idea that ends up blessing the whole family and later comes to bless the whole world. The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible. Copyright Bible Literacy Foundation 2023